All right, so let's continue with connective tissue. Within connective tissue, um, you have three cell types that deal with the extracellular matrix. They are the ones responsible for creating the extracellular matrix. They're the ones responsible for maintaining the extracellular matrix. And when it dictates it, they're also the ones that are breaking down that extracellular matrix. So because we have so many types of connective tissue, usually there's a prefix associated with the cell that is associated with the tissue, the specific tissue we're talking about. So I'm just gonna go with an example. Let's go with bone, okay? The prefix for bone is osteo. I'm sure everybody's probably heard of osteoporosis by now. So osteo just means bone. The matrix cells, the matrix um, making, maintaining, or breaking down cells are called osteoblasts osteocytes and osteoclasts okay so blasts build osteoblasts build the matrix okay they're the ones responsible for creating the matrix that the bone cells the osteocytes are going to sit in so blasts build. You also have chondroblasts because chondro means cartilage. So they're the ones that build the cartilage matrix instead of the bone matrix. You also have the osteocytes. Sites. Okay, osteo means bone, sites means cell. So these are bone cells. So when you have a mature bone that is healthy, these cells sit in the matrix and basically maintain it. They make sure that everything's okay with it. If everything's okay, they just kind of are there. But if something happens and they need to add to it or do things like that, they will. So they basically maintain the matrix, like I just said. Then you've got the ones that break it down the osteoclasts, okay? Osteo bone clasts break down. So they break down bone matrix. So let's say that I break my finger, okay? When you break your finger, or any bone for that matter, you actually have little bits of bone because, I mean, it shatters. Even microscopically, I'm talking about little pieces of bone being somewhere. I'm not talking about like a crush injury or anything, but those little teeny tiny pieces of bone are actually going to have to get cleaned up before I can start repairing. As a matter of fact, the damaged part of my bone where it broke, some of that is going to die. So I actually have to clean that up before I can start repairing. These are the guys that go in and when I need to get rid of bone matrix, they basically melt it away for me. Same with chondroclasts. These are the guys responsible for the matrix when it comes to our connective tissue. Now, the thing with connective tissue is that it is kind of very diverse. Like I said, you've got a lot of packing material and there are cells kind of scattered through there. So you may not just find one specific cell type there. You may find several different types. Adipocytes are one of them. Adipo, adipose, sites, cells. So these are fat cells. You may find these in all kinds of connective tissue. Mast cells. Mast cells are usually found um, beneath membranes and they're found in loose connective tissue along small blood vessels. They actually contain chemicals that when there's an injury, they release the chemicals almost like a red flag going, hey, there's injury here. So you never know where you're going to be injured. You need to have these everywhere. White blood cells or leukocytes, leuco means white, sites mean cells, so white blood cells. 
Um, they move in and out of the connective tissue all the time. White blood cells are literally looking for something to fight. So they have to be mobile. They have to be able to move around your body. Macrophages. Macro means big. Phago from last chapter means eat. These are white blood cells that have transformed into cleaners. So they will take care of things that invade your body. They will take care of bits of debris. Let's say that I get a splinter and dirt gets into that space. These are the guys that'll eat it. But again, being a white blood cell and having to fight disease, this thing has to be mobile. So it'll move through connective tissue to get where it needs to go. And then finally, we have undifferent undifferentiated mesenchymal cells. These are embryonic cells that remain in adult connective tissue. Basically, when it comes to mesenchymal cells, they're kind of like connective tissue stem cells. You can change that cell into any type of connective tissue, but it's kind of at that point that it's not quite anything yet. So we've got these in our body. So if we need replacement, we have some. Is it limited? Yes, there's only so much you can do with it, but it's there. So let's talk about the extracellular matrix, this XCM I've been talking about. It's a combination of three components, okay? And each one, um, each separate connective tissue kind of have their own separate characteristics based on what recipe you follow when you are putting these things together. So protein fibers is one, ground substance is another, and finally we've got the fluid. So protein fibers, we have three types, collagen, reticular, and elastic. Collagen fibers are very strong and they're flexible, but they are not elastic. So I think of the cord to my computer. The cord to my computer, I can roll it up, I can make it into a bow, and I can yank on it. And it's very strong, but it's flexible. I can, you know, wrap it around the leg of the table if I want to, but it doesn't do the elastic thing. Okay. So is it strong? Yes. Is it flexible? Yes. Is it elastic? No. Collagen tends to be kind of the big fiber, almost ribbon-like. Reticular fibers are um, a type of collagen fiber, but they're not strong at all. And they're more filling space than doing anything else. So when it comes to um, a description, something that you can compare it to. I think of packing peanuts. So I want to ship a vase to Canada from Texas. If I put that vase in a box, just shove it in there and ship it, it's probably not going to get there, right? But if I put the little styrofoam packing peanuts in there to fill the space around it, hopefully if the box takes any trauma, it's the packing peanuts that are going to take the trauma and my vase kind of stays floating in the middle, right? So reticular fibers fill spaces, particularly in places where we want to filter things. You've got these fibers, kind of like the fibers in um, a coffee filter that actually help us to filter things. Then you finally have the elastic fibers. Elastic fibers are elastic. Now, I know if I were to say this in class, because it happens every semester, and I were to say, what does elastic mean? People would say, stretch, it'll stretch. And while that is true, that's only half of the equation. If you got chonis and they stretched, and that was all that they did, once you got them over your hips, they didn't snap back to your waist, you probably wouldn't buy that brand of chonis anymore, right? And the reason is because, yes, we want it to stretch, but we want it to snap back. And that's exactly what elastic fibers do. They can stretch, but they always return to that original shape. We have a lot of elastic fibers in our ears. So if you pull on your earlobe, yeah, it'll stretch, but it kind of goes bonk and goes right back to where it was, at least reasonably. Now, the ground substance. 
this is kind of, I'll say the powder that you're adding. So you've got hyaluronic acid. Well, I shouldn't say powder. Hyaluronic acid is kind of an oily, slick fluid. Okay. It makes things slick and it's great for lubrication. So you might be going, okay, why do I need that? Well, think about your joints for a second. Any time that you're moving your joints, you're rubbing cartilage on cartilage. Okay. If you are not lubricating that joint, it would be like ta taking dry rubber and putting it on dry rubber and rubbing it together. That just wouldn't be a good thing. You would eventually start to wear the rubber away, right? But instead, if I were to take rubber, rubber, and put Vaseline in between them and then rub them together, the Vaseline would give it glide so that it's lubricated and it isn't causing any damage. Proteoglycans are another thing that you find in ground substance. Let me read this and then I'll explain. Aggregates that trap water, which give tissue the capacity to return to its original shape when compressed or deformed. I think of proteoglycans as water balloons. They're protein aggregates, they're, they're proteins that hold a volume of water. Now think of a water balloon. I can put a water balloon on the table and I can poke it with my finger, but when I move my finger, it kind of goes and comes right back to what it was, right? That's kind of what proteoglycans do. The more proteoglycan I have in my recipe for extracellular matrix, the easier it is for that tissue to kind of pop out if it's been manipulated. And then finally, we've got adhesive molecules. They actually hold the proteoglycan aggregates together um, and to other structures. So those proteoglycans can't just be floating around. I need them in a specific structure so that they maintain the structure that they're trying to. Think about it as bricks in a building. If I'm going to build a building, the bricks have to be in really specific places. And it's not like I can just put the bricks there. There has to be mortar in between them to hold them where I want them to be. Same concept. And then fluid. Fluid is going to be normally something akin to water with salts, um, with different salts in them, maybe a few proteins, but it's, how much fluid is in this recipe that's going to determine how this um, outcome, what this extracellular matrix is going to be like. So think about this for a minute. I can use flour in so many different recipes. I can use it to make bread. I can use it to make cookies. I can use it to make cake. And all three of these things are very different from each other, even though technically every single one of them has flour in it right? Bread is very dry. Once you're done and you've let it rise and do all of that, it's very dry and it's kind of springy. Cookie dough, depending on which cookies you're doing, they end up, um, they end up more kind of gritty and solid. And let's say I'm making sugar cookies. You roll those out as opposed to bread that you're just kind of putting it in a loaf pan. And then if I'm making cake with flour, I'm making something that is runny. I mean, it pours usually into my little cake pan, right? So technically I've got flour in those, I've got eggs in those, I've got sugar in those, even bread has sugar in it. So what's the difference? the recipe, the quantities of things and how I'm putting them together. It's the same thing here. All of the connective tissues have these things. It's just how much, how did you put them together? All of that. Okay. What's the recipe? So these are the connective tissues. Okay. We've got, sorry, we've got embryonic connective tissue. We've got adult connective tissue in Roman numeral two here, and then we've got kind of the subsets underneath there. So we've got connective tissue proper, we've got supporting connective tissue, we've got fluid connective tissue, and the subsets under here as well. So we're going to talk about those, and we're going to go through them, okay? 
Wait a minute. Did I miss something? Nope. Okay. Just checking. So let's talk embryonic first. These are the first two. You've got mesenchyme and you've got mucous connective tissue. Mesenchyme. The mesenchymal cells are basically irregularly shaped. There's um, the extracellular matrix that is abundant, which again, connective tissue has a lot of packing. Um, and it contains these kind of scattered reticular fibers. Notice I didn't say collagen, I didn't say elastic. These, uh, or this specific tissue, you're going to find in a developing embryo. This is going to be the kind of stem cell start for connective tissues in a developing embryo. Mucous connective tissue is a bit different. Mucous connective tissue is what you find in the umbilical cord of a baby, okay? So it is mesenchymal in the fact that it's kind of a stem cell um, and it remains unspecialized. The cells are very irregularly shaped and the extracellular matrix is still abundant and it does contain scattered reticular fibers. But it's kind of got this specific location. If you've ever heard of, you know, a baby being born and they save the umbilical cord, this is usually why they do it, because this is stem cells. If that baby gets leukemia and needs replacement bone marrow, they don't have to find a donor for that if they've got that umbilical cord. They can actually just get the umbilical cord and give the baby its own cells back. And since it's a stem cell, eventually it'll turn into bone marrow. Now, why don't more people do it? It's expensive. That's why it costs money. And, you know, I would love to say I'm a multi-billion. I'm not. I don't, I don't have that kind of money. I wouldn't have that kind of money to do something like that. Because you're talking about having to pay for the storage of those cells for the long term. And because it's cell storage, there are very specific conditions that you have to meet in order to make sure that nothing gets damaged. So, yeah, it's, it's money. It's, it's a money thing. So that was our embryonic. Now let's talk adult connective tissue. So let's start with connective tissue proper. Connective tissue proper, we're going to start with the loose connective tissues. That includes areolar, adipose, and reticular. If you are in the loose connective tissue um, subheading, basically you've got a few proteins, not many, um, and they form kind of a lacy network. You've got a lot of space in between, um, and it's filled with ground substance and fluid. So you've got areolar connective tissue, adipose tissue, and reticular tissue. Looking at areolar connective tissue, it reminds me of, um, okay, go with me on my journey. I always think of the jello we used to get when we were in school that would have like fruit floating in it. Okay. Now, again, go with me on my journey. I'm not telling you to make this or eat it. Imagine that same jello, except it's got angel hair pasta, it's got lasagna noodles, and it's got um, uh, spaghetti noodles or linguine. Okay. You've got the fibers running through it, and then you've got the little pieces of fruit, which in this case would be the cells. Now, if I want to, I can take my finger and still go through this jello. It's not like it's a solid rock, right? If you look here at this picture, you can see that there are a lot of spaces in between the fibers and the cells. So, Functionally, what does it do? It's loose packing, it's support, and it allows for nourishment um, to structures that it's associated with. So if I need something to kind of wiggle their way through this tissue, there's enough space in between the fibers and the cells that literally it can just work its way through. It can tunnel its way through. Um, as far as location goes, it's really widely distributed, distributed throughout the body. Um, it's packing between glands, muscles, nerves. I always think of it as being under the skin, like under the skin. It attaches the skin to the rest of the stuff that's inside your body. So that's where I think of areolar connective tissue. Adipose tissue. 
adipose tissue and the slides that make it are one of those that you cannot mistake it for anything else. It looks like bubbles, okay? You, you, you've got these big white spaces with the ring around them, okay? So function of adipose tissue. Well, there are quite a few actually. It is packing material. It um, can fill spaces. Hello, baby's cheeks. Everybody, oh, they still have their baby fat, right? Um, it acts as thermal insulation. We talked about the styrofoam cup. It acts as energy storage. This is one of the places that if you're eating, I don't know, 10 Snickers bars a day, you're eating at an excess of calories, instead of just letting it go out in the urine or go out in the fecal material, we store it as fat. And we talked about this earlier, protection. It acts as padding around certain organs. Um, where do you find it? Predominantly, it's under your skin. It's subcutaneous. Um, you can find it in the mesenteries, which are kind of the uh, membranes that surround our internal organs, around the renal pelvis, the kidney. Um, renal is just a fancy way of saying kidney, um, and then around the kidney, um, and the mammary glands. For women, we have quite a bit of adipose at our breasts. And the reason is because if we were just considering ourselves as animals, these would be to feed a baby. Now, the reticular tissue. See these black marks? Almost looks like somebody took a pen or a marker and just kind of made squiggles. That's the reticular fibers. Like I said, they're not particularly strong. They're not particularly thick, but they do fill space. We find them in the lymph node and we find them in the spleen, okay? They provide the superstructure for lymphatic and hemopoietic tissue. What does that mean? They fill the space so that the organ looks like it's supposed to. Instead of filling a balloon with air, imagine filling a balloon with packing peanuts. The balloon would take on the shape of the packing peanuts that were stuffed into it, right? That's basically what they're doing. They're providing the structure for these organs. Now, let's go to connective tissue proper, dense connective tissue, okay? In this category, you're going to have a lot of protein fibers, many, many protein fibers forming really thick bundles that fill almost all of that extracellular space. So remember I talked about changing the recipe, right? In this case, you got a lot of fibers. So you've got dense regular collagenous connective tissue and dense regular elastic connective tissue. Which fiber do you think is going to be most numerous in dense, regular, collagenous connective tissue? Collagen. And then with the dense, regular, elastic connective tissue, what could possibly, yeah, it's the elastic fibers. When you look at regular, dense, regular tissue, it is very nicely organized. Look at this. Here, look at that picture. It looks like somebody took a comb and just went and made that pattern. And it follows the pattern really well. Look over here. Again, you've got that kind of straight pattern to your tissue, okay? So dense, regular, collagenous connective tissue. It is able to withstand great pulling forces exerted in the direction of fiber orientation. We have really good tensile strength and stretch resistance. You find it in tendons, like these little white guys right here that are holding the bicep to um, the shoulder, okay? So let's talk about um, function. Everybody probably knows what a homecoming mom is if you're from Texas. Yeah? Okay. The ribbons that they put on homecoming mums, they are very, very strong if you pull on them up and down. In fact, you could probably even like hang off of a rafter using one of those as long as you're pulling on it up and down. Now, that same ribbon 
start picking at it from the side. What's going to happen? It's going to start to unravel. The direction of the fibers that give it strength are that up and down direction, side to side, not so much. With tendons and with ligaments, it's kind of the same thing. I can, you know, have it, my nephew, you know, throwing a tantrum on the floor and I can grab his foot and I can drag him down the hall and I'm pulling with the fibers of the um, ligaments and tendons in his leg right? So I'm not going to hurt him. He may be mad, but I'm not going to hurt him. However, if I were to take his foot and wrench it to the side, yeah, I would hurt him that way because I'm not going in the direction of the fibers in that case. And if you don't go in the direction of the fibers, it's not going to work the same way. Now, dense regular elastic connective tissue. Um, it's able to stretch and recoil like a rubber band um, with strength in the direction of fiber orientation. So your vocal cords are dense, regular, elastic connective tissue. That's one of the reasons why with your vocal cords, you can change the pitch of your voice. You can go up high like this, or you can go down low like this. It, being able to allow them to stretch or get really, really loose actually helps you to change the pitch of your voice. And the thing is, no matter which one you do, it's not like your voice won't go back to being what your voice was before, unless you damage them. In that case, yes, your voice won't go back. But as long as you're careful, you can change the tension in those vocal cords and they come back. It's like a guitar string. You make a guitar string tighter, the pitch goes higher. You make a guitar string looser, the pitch goes lower. Same concept. Um, so again, the strength for these is in the direction of fiber orientation. If you're rubbing your vocal cords the wrong direction, you'll damage them. Um, Anthony Fauci uh, just went through a surgery to remove a node from his vocal cords. And literally that's when you create a callus on your vocal cords. So they have to go in and remove it. Well, they don't have to, but they'll go in and remove it. Okay. So continuing irregular, dense irregular. Do you see that lovely pattern that looked like I smoothed out sand and then took a cut? No, you don't, right? When I say irregular, I mean irregular. It doesn't look normal, okay? It doesn't look like that perfect normal pattern that we saw in the previous picture. So dense irregular collagenous connective tissue has tensile strength capable of withstanding stretching in all directions. I realize that in this picture, it looks completely random where the fibers are, but there's a method to the madness. So this is one of the things that you find under your skin. Um, and it anchors your skin down in every direction. So everybody has probably had somebody or a kid come up to your arm and go, look, look what I did, look, come here, come here, come here. And they start yanking on your arm. And then when you don't come, they push back or they twist or they twist the other direction because they want you to come, they want you to see, right? Or you've got that aunt who comes up and goes, I can't lean to mama and they take your cheeks and they pull. Ever wonder why your skin didn't fall off? Yeah, this is why. Those collagen fibers are oriented in every direction so that if somebody pulls, it's anchored. And it doesn't matter what direction they pull in. Literally, your skin is anchored in that direction. So while it looks completely random in the picture, it really isn't. So remember we talked about me dragging my nephew by his leg and then twisting? Yeah, with this type of thing, I could twist any direction and it wouldn't matter because I've got collagen fibers that are actually holding it. Now, does it work for that? No, because that's a completely different type of tissue. But you can go up to somebody and squeeze their cheek and move their cheeks around and you know forward and back and everything else and their skin isn't gonna fall off because this holds it in place. Remember, 
collagen has good tensile strength. I can take a cord from an extension cord and go thunk, thunk, and it's not like it breaks, right? You can pull it apart and it doesn't break. That's tensile strength. Now, dense irregular elastic. You find this in um, arteries and veins. See how this is kind of circular? That's because you're finding it in these things here. Now you might go, okay, but that's in a pattern. But think about it. It's not like a sheet pattern. It's not up and down. It's going around in a circle. So you do have that strength, but you also, because it's elastic, have the stretch and the recoil. You find this in elastic arteries. Elastic arteries are capable of bouncing back when there's a huge drastic shift in blood pressure so that I don't have to go, okay, I need to send a signal to the muscle to get my muscle in that thing to contract. No, this is just like your chonus. You pull them out and they go, Kunk. that's what this is. But again, it's not straight. It's in a circular form, so we say it's irregular. Okay, um, supporting, car um, supporting connective tissue. I think I'm going to cut this off here and then I'll do another one.